The front pages that you're waking up to on this Monday, The Telegraph leads on Boris Johnson's comments that urge Vladimir Putin to step back from the brink of war. The Mirror also runs with the same story, saying countdown to war. Times says that international leaders will make a last-ditch effort to prevent that war in the Ukraine. The Guardian runs with radical action as they say help is needed to urgently tackle the overwhelming ethnic health inequalities in the NHS. Here to discuss those headlines and everything else in the papers, we welcome Tonya Buxton and James Bloodworth. Very good to see you both. James, starting with you, front page of the Metro, um, and it says, um, West can't Vladi scare Putin. And this was the uh, Russian ambassador to Sweden, I think it was, uh, with what he thought about sanctions. Yeah, so the Russian, Russians are ridicu ridiculing the threat of economic sanctions if Russia invades Ukraine. So he, one of his officials has said, you know, excuse my language, and I won't repeat it, but we don't give a damn about all of our, their sanctions. Um, I think this is bluster because the sanctions, sanctions have been imposed on Russia since 2014, since it invaded Crimea. And sanctions have actually damaged the Russian economy, economy quite significantly. So I think the, the Atlantic Council put out a report fairly recently that showed that economic growth in Russia's 2.5 to 3% a year less than it would have been without the sanctions. And there's no likelihood of significant growth in Russia's economy until the sanctions are lifted. So I think it does have an effect on Russia. I don't know whether it's enough to stop the invasion, but it's certainly something, it's certainly a way to punish Russia should it invade it's, Ukraine. It's really interesting you talk about the impact on the Russian economy. The reality is that it would have an impact on ordinary Russians, but those yes. with the, the, the huge treasure troves, they I mean, they've been stockpiling ahead of this. In some of the papers I was re reading that he's literally, Putin has built a, a war chest in the expectation of sanctions because the West was so slow in the, after the invasion of, of um, Crimea to impose sanctions that they've really changed their strategy this time. So perhaps it will just be the ordinary Russians that, that feel it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the depressing side of this in that we can sanction, sanction Russia, but ordinary Russians feel it, but Putin and, and his cronies tend, uh, tend not to. But, I mean, on the, on the other side of that, that the, um, it does breed discontent in Russia, which has shaken Putin's regime in recent years. Okay. Ago. Um, education in the Telegraph, page 10, Tonya. Mm -hmm. And this is about um, university students falling further behind. More lecturers are threatening to go on strike. It's unbelievable. So we've got, you know, 52% of university students feel that they are way behind where they should be now. And so much of that is to do with online learning. You yeah. know, 58% of students do not like online learning. I mean, we pay all that money to send our children to university or they get into so much debt and yet they're, they're sitting in their rooms. They're not getting the university experience, not getting any of that. And then on top of that, they, we've got 50,000 university lecturers leaving, walking out. Uh, uh, 68 universities are taking part and they're doing it because they, they said that it's a, a terrible pay and working conditions and their pensions. I just, don't these people care about the students? Don't they care about what our kids have gone through But you don't care about the lecturers, the do you, and years? their conditions? Oh, you know, I've looked scale. at their conditions. It's still not that bad. Considering the hours they work and what they get, it's not bad. Not bad at all. So I'm pretty, pretty upset about this. And if I was... I reckon you've here, upset a few lecturers now as well. So be it. That, so, so be it. I just do think that they need to kind of just, you know, suck up a little bit like we've all had to suck up over the past two years and put students first. I think a lot of people will probably think twice about sending their kids or kids wanting yeah. to go. We talked about National Apprenticeship Week last week, yeah, didn't yeah, we? And, yeah. and wonder if perhaps there is a mood change given the, the poor quality of teaching that people have experienced, not just in the pandemic, but going forward, as you say. Perhaps it's, you know, the time of university might have passed. Yeah, I mean, I think I went to university and it benefited me a lot. So I would, would be reluctant to tell people just not to go to university. But I think sometimes you can be missold the university experience. So the idea that you'll automatically make a lot more money and work having gone to university, when I think nowadays skills are much more in demand, so it can be better to learn a skill than to go to university and learn a subject where it's going to be very hard to get a mm. job afterwards. Yeah. Um, stick, sticking with education, and I suppose this is sort of young people focus, James, that you've picked up on in The Guardian, and all this talk, again, we talked about this a lot last week with this uh, harms bill going through government at the moment, trying to protect youngsters from accessing porn. This is a, this is a piece about face ID and, and the implications, the wider implications that that could have. Yeah, I mean, the, the Internet has kind of been a wild west for a long time and governments are kind of catching up and now trying to regulate things. In this case, pornography, stop children viewing pornography, which I think is something we can all kind of agree on. Um, but it's like, how, how is the best way to do that? And one of the issue, issues has been that porn 
pornography doesn't just appear on pornography websites. It also appears on social media sites, on things like Reddit. And therefore, people are worried that if you have to have certain forms of ID to prove your age on, uh, you know, to access pornography, you're now going to have to have these complex like, ID, digital ID systems for all kinds of social media platforms. And then that privacy issues come into that because how do you, how, how do you verify people's, people's ID? And you've got like face ID. And it, it gets kind of complicated, and it, there's, there also then criminals find new ways to steal people's ID. So it's, it's quite, it sounds very simple. We need to stop children accessing pornography, but it's actually quite a fraught and complicated issue. Do you think that there is a strong enough appetite to tackle this problem? Or if, I don't know. I'm, I'm cynical about it. I feel like a lot of the consumers of porn are the ones who are deciding how and it should be regulated. And I think a lot of people, perhaps largely men, aren't that worried about the impact that it has it on, on the younger generation. I think, I think, Isabel, for porn, you're not going to stop them seeing it because they can get it on their phone at any time. I think where it should start is education at schools, te teaching children that they will see things that they can't unsee and make them, make them be more responsible for not going out and but seeking it. But we all it. remember our sex education at school and how we sort of laughed at our I teachers and we sniggered, oh, right. <laughs> That's not going to cut through to young people. They say, don't watch porn. I don't no 14-year-old boy's going to listen to that. I don't think it's a way to say don't watch porn. I think you need to, they, they, need to have, they have these PHSE uh, conversations now in schools. And the conversation would be, just be careful of what you see because it can psychologically affect you later in life. And I think having that type of conversation might help because the thing is I just don't think you're going to stop these kids seeing these things because it's everywhere. Yeah, but you might stop, I think James's point may be as well, the general audience which these sites rely on, um, it may make a lot of people think, oh, I'll not be watching that because my details are there and, you know, mm -hmm. that might end up mm -hmm. somewhere that I that I don't want it, and uh, these, these, these sites, I suppose, they're there to make money, aren't exactly. they? Exactly, it's bad for yeah. business. Yeah. I think it's an extra hoop for people to jump through to view that stuff, and I also do think we do need to do something about the things that young children are being exposed to online, because, I mean, as someone who's, who's 39 now, when I was younger, it was kind of pre-internet, and there'd be kind of the, the mucky magazines on the top shelf, but then the things kids are able to see on the internet now is it's you know it's a hundred times more than that is and it's it, I think it can have an effect on them in how they view kind of sexuality and things in in later life and it's not necessarily healthy. Yeah, <laughs> understatement. Uh, <laughs> here's a here's a very very interesting story now in uh, Wales uh, where they are thinking uh, of trimming the working week from five days to four days. Yes, and this is, this is an experiment. Wales isn't the first place to try this, so New Zealand have tried a similar experiment. There's been another one in Sweden, and it's quite counterintuitive because when people hear, you know, cutting the working week to four days, they think, you know, invariably less work will be done. But, but with these experiments, they found that there were actually productivity gains of 10%, 20%, and so they're looking at it in Wales now. Um, and it's about kind of working smarter, not necessarily, but longer, not necessarily longer hours. So, would you get paid the same money though for working four days than five? No, because... you take a pay cut. I think I understand. Yeah, that's it. that's the kind of that's the the main kind of debate over this. Whether I'm not sure if you should take a pay cut if you're coming into work, but yeah. you're being actually more productive. Yeah. Why? Why should well, you take a pay cut? I think we really need right. to um, be clear on the productivity thing because you know you might be more productive in the hours that you're there, but you're actually there for fewer hours. So actual overall productivity is still down, and I think that it's a bit of a kind of PR twist of people who really want the four-day working week saying, well, I'm actually more productive during those hours that I'm just there. whether people can afford a four-day yeah. week. Yeah. yeah. I think they have found in some of the experiments in, in New Zealand, I think it was, some people were just overall more productive with fewer hours, hours which was that, that sounds very appealing. If it's measured per hour but rather than total output, I, I But question the success it. seems to be in Wales where they're trying to do it to, to reduce people's stress because uh, they have so many people off sick. And it is the public sector. So that what is what makes me a little bit sceptical about it all. You know, if you're in a pr private sector, it's not quite as easy to do that. Mm. Tonya, in The Express, this is page 18, mm -hmm. um, a daughter successfully campaigns to see her mother in care. She can now see her mum every day. What's the story? So the the story was that uh, Lynn Embleton, uh, was, she was put on antidepressants because she couldn't get to see her mum.
Because uh, the care home would not let her in. Uh, she was refused essential caregiver status, um, which every resident should be able to have in order mm. to be visited. She missed her mum's birthday on the 23rd of December. She's 102, her mum. dear. And, dear, uh, dear. you know, her mum said that she felt like she was a prisoner and she wanted to die. And this is, again, another example of where lockdowns really failed. They failed. They hurt people and they harmed them. Because there, there should never be a reason, if you, know, if, you've tested, if, you're not, if you haven't got COVID and you go to a care home, that you shouldn't be allowed in to see your mum, who's 102. I mean, what is the point? What are you saving her from? Mm. We, you know, she's 102, she wants to see you. So you're making the end of her days really miserable for some stupid rules that don't really... I mean, we now know from the Anthony Hopkins report that, um, that there is no good to lockdowns and there's no reason for a lot of them. And as long as you're being safe and careful, I think a lot of these care homes decided to just stop everyone coming in because it makes their lives a lot easier. Well, very early on in the pandemic, of course, there was no vaccine and there were no access to this tests. Yeah. And so, you know, and we saw how much the, the virus swept through yeah. the care homes, which is why there was perhaps this overcompensation in, in trying yeah. to protect these vulnerable later, people. Though, yeah. shouldn't be going on. Yeah. Uh, you've also chosen a story in The Mirror, page yes. 11 in The Mirror, jabs mm. for children over five could soon take effect. Yeah, it says that families have complained of holiday plans being thwarted, thwarted because of under 12s not being jabbed. I mean, I just, I, it, it takes my breath away. There is no long term data for this. I mean, the JVCI said there was no benefit to vaccinating 12 to 16 year olds, um, just possible harms. And yet here we are talking about jabbing five year olds so that you can go on holiday. I mean, this is insane. And just to kind of get it into con. So you understand it. The risk of death from COVID-19 between if you're zero to 19 years old is 0.003 percent. Uh, the risk of Earth being hit by an asteroid is 0.046 percent. So, you know, don't go jabbing your children until we know it, they need it. And uh, maybe put a helmet on, you know, like one of these helmets, <laughs> these cycling helmets on so you don't get hit by an asteroid. I mean, I think it's it's really wrong. And it. It, we're very lucky now that we've got lots of vaccines for people that are, you know, needing them and it's endemic. <laughs> so we should move on and not be thinking about giving medication to kids James, that we don't need. James, finally and briefly, in The Guardian, I uh, saw this story myself and there's a, a conservative climate group and they're saying, look, we've got an energy crisis here. Uh, what are they doing in terms of lobbying the Prime Minister? Well, they want Boris Johnson to reverse his... his moratorium on fracking, so to, to start fracking again, um, because we, we, we will all be hit by the increasing energy bills this year. So gas prices wholesale around the world are going up and Britain is still reliant significantly on gas for our energy. So they're calling for Johnson to lift the ban on fracking. I do find there's a certain, they, I think they have a point, but I also think there's a certain irony in this. Is, it seems to be the same group which is very against green energy, whereas I think we probably need a mixture of energy sources to kind of move away from our dependence on gas, so nuclear, green energy, fracking perhaps. But I, I, don't, I think it's a bit, uh, bit rich for them to come out very pro-fracking when they've been dead against the green stuff, which has yeah. been this, the same aim to move us away from gas. OK, guys, thank you both very much indeed. That was James Bloodworth and Tonya Buxton, and they've been reviewing the papers for us this morning. Thank you both very thank much indeed. Very thank much. you.